Okay, so <clears throat> it's a pleasure to uh, introduce today Ruth Ray Harfert, an old friend uh, who will speak about irreducible representations of Levit path algebras. Please, Ruth. Go All ahead. right. Um, thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Um, and um, First of all, I'm going to repeat it. this talk uh, I gave in, in Colorado. So I, I apologize to Jean, Rango, and others if they have heard this talk. Uh, I'm just going to repeat really the same thing. Um, so the talk is a joint work with Raymond Prusa and Alexander Chekolov. Uh, they are both in St. Petersburg now. And um, the the good fact, the fun fact is that we all studied in Bielefeld in the last uh, decade, two, two decades, in a span of two decades, all of us studied in Bielefeld under the same super, supervisor, Anthony Beck. All right, so now um, let me just remind you, I'm sure uh, most of you know, but let me just start with the, with the, the algebra that defined by William Levy. So I look at the, the paper actually today, and it started, I think, in 1955, 1955. So William, uh, William Levitt, 1955. And he introduced this algebra. So he got a um, bunch of symbols. And I would get these symbols coming from all the way from one to, let me just put K plus one here. So this is a free um, algebra. So let me just write here. This is a free K algebra. And then I want to emphasize it's a free unital K algebra. So he gets that and then he divides this with two relations. One of them is he arranges the Y symbols here and then the X symbols in one in column like this. And if you multiply these two, uh, two matrices, he forces this to be one. And then he would swap the positions here and does the same thing. Now this time you get a K plus one, K plus one matrix. And then again, it forces this to be one. So you understand it's a K, K plus one, K plus one matrix and on diagonal is one, everywhere else is zero. So let me just put one here or, you know, it, if you really want to be very precise, K plus one. All right, so these are the relations. And let me call this L1N or also A. Okay, so he introduced this. And the first thing also he shows is that first of all, this is not zero your, because of course you can- Sorry, you can, your, N, your, K, your little K is an N or your N is a little K. Oh yeah, that's K plus one, sorry, yes. This is K plus one now, K plus one. All right, maybe it's a little bit. K plus one. Okay, so first of all, he shows that this is not zero, this, this algebra, because you just look, you can just plug here what you want, you know, your favorite relations. And what are the chances that the whole algebra would not collapse to zero? So this A is not zero, so it's a ring. Then he proves that this in fact is a simple ring. So um, I think in his paper, in fact, he goes a bit further. He says that if you get an element in A, in one go, you can make this one. You don't have to look at the sum of this form to make it one. In one go, you can make this one. So big K is a field. K is a field. So the coefficients coming from a field K, right? Yeah, right, K. At the moment, the coefficient coming from the field K. So K is a field, yes. All right, and then the next thing he, he this, this bit is easy. Of course, then you can show it's, I think at 
in good undergrad um, exercise that now one copy of A is isomorphic to K plus one copies of A as a left or right A module. And um, the way you do it, you send A, I think to, let me just, I don't get it wrong, that K plus one copies of A. And then the other way back also, you can just do K plus one A to A, sending A1 to AN to sum of YI AI. I from one to K plus one. Again, I just make mistakes here. Okay, so that, that means that A is isomorphic to A plus K plus one as A module. Okay, so this is the example that he has there. And then he just goes further and shows that um, there is some sort of a rank here and so on. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, okay, so why don't I instead of looking one row and one column, just put more of this here. So more ro rows and more columns and more symbols, and then define it that way. So let me just write that down also. So now I, I need to be a bit more quicker. So this time he goes instead of one and K plus one, he goes from N and K plus N and the relation, let me just write the relations first. Previously was from one to y k plus one. Now I put here k plus n and one. And then I go here from here, n rows, n rows and k plus n columns. And you do the same with x. This time you get x one one, you go for the one or x one n. Here it becomes x n plus k n one. And here becomes x n plus k n n. And then he forces this to be one. So therefore the, no, the, number, the number of symbols are more. So here y i j, and then i from one to n and j from one to k plus n. And the same trick he, swap the positions and also so this is again this becomes x this becomes y the same one and forces this to be one now you understand these ones again you have to see what kind of matrices you have one of them would be k n, n plus k n plus k matrix the other is k uh, n by n matrix okay he forces that now so let me just concentrate on these relations here now here you have more rows and columns you just force this to be one. And what he shows, first of all, again, that this is not zero. Very curious, I don't see right away from here, from here, I don't see that, that this A is a domain, i.e. there is no zero divisors, but look here, this one that he defines, Right off the bat, there are a lot of zero divisors. Look, x1, when you multiply with y2, you get zero divisor. With y3, you get zero. So there are a lot of zero divisors in this ring. But as soon as you increase the number of rows and columns, it becomes a domain. And then the same trick, you can see that here, a n this time is isomorphic to a n plus k as a module. And something interesting here happens that, look, this property here that in a ring, the dimension, if you're looking at, uh, so a space of dimension one is the same, is at the same time is a space of dimension K plus one. This would not happen if you are working with nice rings. For example, with, with fields, if you are working with a field, it is not possible that dimension one at the same time is dimension two. That's not gonna happen. I mean, the whole linear algebra is based on, you have this dimension. But if you relax the situation out of a field to something more general, that might happen. Now, here, what you proved, questions? Yeah, uh, you said it, it becomes a domain, what? What are the conditions on M and K so that it becomes a domain? No, it has to be, you have to have 
Uh, this n has to be more than one. So if n is more than one, it's already it's, it's always the domain. Uh -huh. That's right. Okay. All right. All right. So now what happens here is that, look, if you are working with this, the space is n dimension now. Just imagine that, and it repeats itself in a higher dimension. But if you stay in a lower dimension, this is not going to happen. I mean, for example, if you are if I'm working with n equal to two and k is one. So if I'm working in the case that n is two and k is one, so that means that two copies of A is isomorphic to the three copies of A. It is not possible that if you are working with in one dimension, then somehow you tilt your head and you would be at the same time in a two dimensional case. This is not gonna happen, okay? So in one dimension, it's not gonna, the base would not increase. But as you go in higher dimension, then suddenly this phenomenon would happen. So he proves that also that if you are staying lower than N, the base has a unique rank. Okay, so these two, two algebras. And then as you know, um, the Levit path algebra is gonna generalize all these. Namely, instead of just this one example, if I look at graphs and I look at a graph with I think K plus one loops and plug into the machinery of Levit path algebra, I would get this example. And then, of course, if I change graph, I get all kinds of examples. So for this one here, Levit path algebras would not cover this because, again, Levit path algebras, they're full of zero divisors, except maybe you are working with just one point or one loop. All other Levit path algebras, they have a lot of zero divisors. And this one already is a domain. So you cannot get these kind of examples from Levy path algebra. So maybe you need to do something else. And then I'm gonna mention maybe the weighted graphs. If you introduce weighted graphs, you can cover these one here also. All right, so now let's go towards describing what is a Levy path algebra. Again, I know most of you know much more than me, but okay, let me just go ahead and remind you. So you start with a graph and a graph looks like this. So you have vertices, you have edges here, and the edges, they have directions, so you know where you are going. So a bit of uh, notation. So E, the source of E, where it starts, I call it S of E, and then where it ends, the range of E. And once you have a graph, I can define something very, very classical called the path algebra of this graph. So the path algebra, of E, and this is, I think, practically, it just guarantees that you can genuinely move along the graph. So if you can move along the graph, you get an element in the algebra, but if you cannot, if you jump, then you would get zero. So how, how would I create this um, algebra? So get the free algebra generated by all the vertices and all the edges. So let me just now write, this is a free, K algebra, K is a field. And this time I don't get a unit all, I just said a free K algebra. So I don't put the empty word in there, okay? So this is just a free K algebra. Now the relations, it's very, very smart. You, you need only two relations to capture that sort of legal movement. One is that source of an edge times the edge itself is E and the same with the range. And here E comes from, it's an edge. I think these two are enough to capture the movement. So let me just show you, for example, here you have a free algebra, so I can get um, E and I get G and I can continue with G. So E, G, and I can just do another loop. So I have another G, that's fine. And I can go now E, G, 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 for example, or even, no, maybe I just leave it there. It's, it becomes A. So this is an element in this algebra. But now if I say G and then E, look, this is G, then I cannot go back. So the direction is wrong. So I want this to represent zero and these two 
is enough to, to make this collapse to zero because G is the same as G range of G and E is the same as uh, source of E, E, but now I have U, V. Oh, I have to here also put that U and V is zero for U and V in E zero and they are different. Okay, then I get G zero, E is zero. So then really I got all the legal paths representing in this path, path algebra. Okay, so that's that. Now very quickly moving on to Levy path algebras. For Levy path algebras, you have the same graph. Let me see if, I can, if this works. Copy. Please. So you have the same thing, but now this time you have to add, uh, if you have an edge going one direction, you have to add an edge going backward also. So here, all these edges have a dual edge going backward. And in the literature, they call it uh, ghost edges. or a double of this graph. Maybe I just call it a double of this graph. So I call this ED, okay. Now, in order to define the Levy path algebra, so L of E, you do the same trick. You define a free algebra, a K free algebra using vertices, all the vertices, all the edges, and all these ghost edges. Now the relations is the same one as path algebra. So maybe I just put the path algebra of this ED. So path algebra, oops. The path algebra of ED. And then relations, let me just show you with an example again, what are the relations? So, you have already some relations here. So you have these relations already here, but you have a bit more, which takes into account now these ghost edges. So if you are in this situation, U, E, F, G, graph looks like this. And in this situation, you add these relations also. You would be able to recover U by going along all the edges getting out of U and come back. So. I add this relation. So you see, you go and come back, you go and come back, and you have to imitate this in for every edge is getting out, and then you recover U, but it's not symmetric. So in this case, you have to do this only once. So H star H, then it gives you B. So being and coming back. And then here also, I always forget, if you mix this, you would get zero. So if you go H star, and then you do any other edge, you always get zero. So you should not mix this. Okay, so this is an example of how you introduce these new relations. And this gives you a Levy path algebra. Okay, and yes, there, there is a book now. I just mentioned the book, book, here, yeah, book by Jean. Perry and Mercedes Levy path algebras. And I felt it's 2019, but it's 2017. Okay, so now the game of course starts here. If I change the graph, what would happen to this Levy path algebra? But the direction I want to go is to introduce representations for these algebras. So what, what do I mean by representations? So next, representation. And this is the way I, I, one way I imagine, maybe you want to say this is not a good way to say things, but okay. So you start with the ring R, what, what do I mean by representation? Representation. Okay. So you start with the ring R, and this ring could be very sort of very abstract. You, 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 you know, the elements you cannot really feel, you know, like up, upstairs, you start with some symbols and some relations, which, you know, might not mean anything. But if you would be able to push this into a matrix ring, 
then it, it feels much better because each element now represents as a matrix. Okay, already you can you have you see what's happening, and oftentimes this matrix comes with entries in a field K. And it, that opens also doors because you can also look at the traces of this or the determinant of this and so on. So if you're lucky to do this, that's what I call a representation of the elements or in fact, a representation of a ring R. Oh, and it's finite and, for you? No, okay. So I'm just giving an example. No, no, it doesn't necessarily mean N is finite. So if you push it into a, some sort of a matrix thing, you know, and doesn't need to be finite, okay. But here, just imagine, I'm just, you know, philosophically. Okay, so now, as an, and you know, matrix rings are very, very, uh, matrix rings are uh, very complex. In fact, um, you know, T.Y. Lamb always says, God bless matrices, because first of all, they are very com complex, but at the same time, very rich. So maybe I just tell you this example before I go further. The quaternions. So Hamilton quaternion division ring. So this one, because I work in Ireland, uh, Hamilton is the most celebrated scientist in Ireland. And he discovered uh, the quaternion algebras. And the story is a true story is that he actually tried for 15 years. So you, you look at complex numbers. So this field, complex numbers, which has dimension two over R, and he wanted to go one step further. So create a field, which has dimension three over R. And he was, you know, for 15 years going back and forth. Then he realized, no, he has to go one step further. The dimension has to be four. And then he has to drop the commutativity then you have a ring which each element has inverses, each non-zero element has an inverse, nice like fields, but then there is nothing in degree three and in degree four, well, you have to uh, drop, uh, yeah, commutativity. And it took him for, uh, yeah, 15 years to do this. And it was, it's difficult because we know now, I forgot the name, we know that there is only unique quaternion algebra over R there is a unique division ring over R and that's this one. So he was looking for a unique example, but all along you can see that this is sitting in here. So even if you look at the books, you can completely describe Hamiltonian as elements of this, this ring here. Okay, so this is another way to represent Hamiltonian inside this matrix ring and therefore it gives you traces and uh, determinant, it gives you norm and so on. All right, so now, um, Maybe you are not that lucky. So um, I, actually I can write this as an endomorphism of a vector space over K and here uh, really, so this V could be infinite dimensional. And then you push R inside this. Um, sometimes you are not lucky. You cannot get in, um, yeah, you cannot get uh, that R sits in here, but that's okay. Still, if you would be able to create some V that R acts on it, that's good enough. And sometimes also you are not lucky to get the vector spaces. You can just get a set that R acts on it. So this becomes like a module, right? So this is your V and R acts on this. And in a way, this maybe gives you some image of R inside this V. And if you have more of these and you look at all of them, then you know maybe you can get the structure of R reflecting in the whole setting. So, and when I, when I say that R acts on this V, reality means that this V is an R module, W is an R module. So I'm really looking at the, this category, category. And of course, if I know a lot about the category of modules of a ring, then I know a lot about the structure of a ring. So this is what I mean by a representation, finding a module over R and then irreducible, representation or a simple one, same same name, is that, okay, I have this V here and then I can push the elements via R and there is not possible to find another one, another representation inside it. So it would be the smallest one that R acts on it. If that happens, then I call it a simple representation. Okay. And now, well, this is the story. Now I want to concentrate on Levy path algebra and find 
yeah, irreducible representation for Levy path algebras. Okay, so again, um, there is a general way to construct um, representation for path algebras. I think this was known for a long time. For path algebra of E, and then I concentrate on uh, Levy path algebra. So here it is very uh, quickly. So imagine your graph looks like this. E, F, so it, this is your graph and this is your E and P of E is the graph uh, path algebra. So how can I get a module? How can I create a module over that? One way is this, just put here some vector spaces. Maybe I call it B, W, and B, Z. They could be infinite dimensional, they would be finite dimensional, whatever you want. Just place them on the vertices. And also give me uh, linear transformations between them. Okay. Now, I claim each of these. So this gadget here, each of these gives you a module over the path algebra. So what I call this, I call this a representation of E, this gadget that I put here, okay? So representation of E. Each of these gives me one representation. So let me give you another one. So imagine again, this was your graph E. Z, V, W, F. Just put something else here, maybe W, V, W, 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 Z. And then here would be uh, Psi of E and Psi of F. So that's another representation. And get all these objects, all these distribution of vector spaces, and that gives you a category. So now I have to give you the morphism between these, and the morphism is what you guess between this object and this object, the morphisms are uh, maybe in different color. So it has to go all the ve vector spaces upstairs. You just bring it to the vector spaces down the stairs with this, morph this linear transformation and then everything commutes as usual. So that gives you a category here. And the nice thing is that you can prove that the category of modules over PE is equivalent to this representation graph here, okay? So in a way, I could produce all the modules over PE out of this, this description here, okay? And then, so this is very classical, very classical, and then, There is a paper by Edward Green. I really, really write, like this paper, Edward Green, Transaction of AMS, 1983. It's called Graphs with Relations. And he says that, by the way, if your path algebra, you divide it with some relations here, if you imitate that relations on this level, then you have, a rep you, you have the same equivalence of categories. So everything goes through. So mod PE relations. Then uh, I mentioned to you how it's done. Then you will have a representation of E and then you have to introduce those relations here. Then you still have an equivalent. So what do I mean by this introducing these relations here? Let me just give you by one example. Okay, so in terms of Levy path algebra, for example, in Levy path algebra, you have E and then you have E star, and then you say E, e star in this very particular example is V, right? So the way you introduce it here, well, of course, now because you have relations, and you have E and E star. First of all, I need to have also phi E star, phi F star. And then 
I have these linear transformations, I have to introduce the, in a way that I have this relation also on the level of vector space, okay? So I push, if I can, I push all these relation on these levels and then I have an equivalence here. Okay. Between the modules over this Levy path algebra, or in fact, any other algebra with paths and relations, and this very sort of combinatorial uh, representations. But again, I think this way, it's very difficult. For example, if I ask you, could you give me the simple ones? Which, which of these are simple? Can you describe it? Even if I give you concrete relations, I think it's still very difficult you give me the simple one or maybe in decomposable one. So I know all the, all the modules are here, but which ones are incomposable? Can you describe it in these terms? I think it's very difficult. In fact, already on the level of path algebra, I think it's called, it's a Gabriel's theorem, celebrated Gabriel's theorem that describes the decomposable one, which ones are decomposable, something like that. So I think it's not very easy. Okay. So are there other ways to construct modules and in particular simple modules over Levy path algebras? Okay. I feel a bit bad because a lot of people here know this stuff uh, much better than me, but okay, sorry about that. Okay, so now on the, on the setting of uh, Levy path algebra, Shawu, Shawu Chen, so a young, mathematician from Hefe in China came up with ver this very sort of very, very interesting way to construct modules for the big path algebras. And here how he did this. So you have this E, which is a graph. And then imagine that you would be able to construct an infinite path. So your graph is in such a way that you have an infinite path here. So for example, this is your graph. G, and then I would get the infinite path. As an example, E, G, G, E, G, G, and so A, 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 and go down. Okay, so this is an infinite path. Then he collects all the paths which are tail equivalent to this one, i.e., the path which eventually they coincide and go forever together. Maybe another one here. And then all go together, okay? All right, so get all the paths which are tail equivalent to P and here is your module. I call it VP is the K vector space generated by all tail equivalent paths, infinite paths to P, okay? So formally just put them as a sum next to each other, right? So all these. And now I have to tell you how you multiply, well, how LE acts on this VP, right? And everything should be well-defined. And again, I think this is very cute and you, you see right away how, what's happening. So as an example, just give you an example. E, do I have an F, G, maybe H here. Okay, so imagine your path is G, H, G, H, and so on. So maybe I just write here G, H, G, H, and go on. And so this is one pa infinite path. This is the path you have. Now you want to act with elements of Levy path algebra because Levy path algebra has to act on this vector space. Okay, so let's just get one element, maybe E, E, and I want to multiply it with this one. And I think you guessed what I want to do. If I can fit E before G, I just put them next to each other. Here it is. And here I can, okay, so I just put it there. If I cannot, then E times that thing would be, it would give me zero, all right? So if I can attach, I would. If I cannot, it gives me zero. How about E star? Because I'm working with ghost edges also. I have to tell you how I act the ghost edges. Well, E 
if I'm multiplying, say, ghost SG star with this one, well, as always, G star is, I mean, this is like a cancellation. So I would cancel this, and what I would get is this path. And again, as you see, this path again is infinite. It's again tail equivalent to the previous one. So I'm still in this vector space. And the next step is that, well, you have to check that your relations of Levy path algebra fits here, namely what I just mentioned, this action is well defined. And you can do this. So he proved, in fact, that this VP is a LE module. And in fact, it's an LE simple module. He further goes and says that, okay, so if you have two different infinite paths, they are these two vectors, uh, these two modules are isomorphic if and only if P and Q are tail equivalent. So it's very tight. So you get tail equivalent. So you get a lot of um, simple modules. As soon as you just come up with one infinite path, gives you a simple module, another one which is not tail equivalent to this one, you get a different simple module. And um, so it started uh, a whole series of paper, Chen simple module. And I have to emphasize Rangos, Ranga, Ranga Suwami also did major work and he came up with some generalizations. So there are other simple uh, modules besides these, but they do not cover all the simple modules. Again, Rango can correct me if I'm wrong, for example, for, uh, yeah, for one vertex and two loops. So the Levy path algebra of this. Well, I have a lot of infinite paths here. I get a lot of simple modules, but these are not all the simple modules. There are others that yet to be discovered. Okay, so now that was, that was the intro, uh, introduction. Uh, and one, one little question. The, mm. There is this fact, uh, this theorem that uh, that the path algebra, not Levit path algebra, on this graph, which is the free algebra on two generators, the the module theory of it is undecidable. So, like you cannot classify the modules. Uh, is there any hope that? when you pass to the Levit path algebra, so that you invert things, that you can classify the module? Because you start when, you start badly, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, that I don't know. What, when, you, when you say not decided, what, what does that, uh, yeah, what, what does it really mean? I, I, well, I, I, it's vague in my mind, but if you look at books like Benson's book on representation and cohomology, or these books that uh, I once, I mean, like, I don't know, 20 years ago, had to teach a course on path algebras. And uh, I remember this, this result was there, but yeah, you have to look back the, the, the literature, but the people in, representations of, uh, you know, Altin algebras and so on, often mention this. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Um, uh, I suppose I, I... they refer to, to finding all in the composable modules, but, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I... Mm -hmm. Mm. I, I don't know. Good, good question. Mm, yeah. All right. So now I just need to move on to the paper with uh, Raymond and Alexander. And there, okay, so you have seen one way to construct simple modules. There is another way. And this way you can actually generalize to weighted sort of Levy path algebras and get simple modules or all kinds of modules for not only for this kind of Levy path algebras, 
but for this kind, uh, maybe k n plus k also. So you can get also simple modules for these kind of mod, um, algebras. So let me just give you the philosophy of what we are doing. Okay, so you have this graph and you get this algebra and then, well, then here you had some module that I constructed coming out of E. But the idea is that maybe I can get some graph out of E, some construction out of E, I do something and I get another graph. And from this graph, I get some gadget. And then this becomes a module over LE. So that means not only the algebra comes from a graph, but the modules of this algebra comes from some related graphs. Can I do that? And the answer is yes, we, I can do it that way. But let me just remind you what is a weighted Levy path algebra. So then I, I can do all this in one go. So first of all, weighted Levy path algebras. And Ryman is a, an, an expert on, on these algebras and he has, uh, couple of very, very good papers on these. Um, so first of all, if I give you a graph, okay, so this is a graph edges and vertices. So a weighted one is that I just put weight on each edge. So maybe I can, I say that E has weight three and F has weight two. And the way you can visual this is that, well, draw E has three layers and F has two layers here. Okay, so this is a weighted graph. Now I have to give you what is a weighted Levy path algebras. Okay, so you have L with weight. As usual, you get the path algebra, but the path algebra of this graph, so let me call this one E hat. So when I say E hat means I'm just considering all of these at the same time. So you get a path algebra of E hat. Now, what are the relations? And I give you the relations also with examples. So U maybe E1, E2, E3, F1, F2, and G1, G2, okay. All right, now here you have an edge which has um, weight three, you have an edge which has weight two and you have an edge which has weight two. So what, what relations would you put here? Now, look at these as, look at or imagine this graph which has three layers, layer one, layer two and layer three and write the Levit path algebra relation for the first layer. So I get E1, E1 star, F1, F1 star, G1, G1 star, and that gives you U, right? So forget the other layers. Go to the second layer and write it. So you get E2, E2 star, F2, F2 star, and G2, G2 star, U. And then go to the third layer. There, in the third layer, there is only one edge, E3. So you get E3, E3 star is U. And then, if you mix layers, then you would get zero. Namely, if you go with E1 and you come back with E2 star. If you go with F1, you come back with F2 star and G1, G2 star, then you get zero. So any mixed layer, you would get zero. Okay, so that gives you CK1 or maybe CK2, okay? That, that relations that you have. Now, the other one was, what if I remember, what if I start with its star and then do H? Um, okay, so imagine you have here Sorry, may, may I ask, is E hat the cover with respect to this, I mean, associated to, to these weights? No. Uh, I don't call it cover, I just call it that, I mean, if E has, I don't I mean, have... Uh, um, I, I have a definition for covering of a graph, and this is not that. Um, but, but I mean, if you have a, you have this notion that you use uh, in your papers that you have a map from E1 to a group, 
this is not a group, a semi group, but uh, then uh, you can associate a new graph. Right, right. No, this is not that. This is uh -huh, not that. Uh -huh. oh, okay. This is just, yeah, this is, this is not that. Yeah, I, I understand that. This is not that. It, yeah. That, that covering of a graph is not this, is not this construction. No. It, here, it just, you, you just give weight to the edges. All right, and then the last one is that previously in the Levit path algebra, I have H star H is V. Here, the way you do it, you concentrate on, on this edge and it has two layers, H1 and H2. You write the, that um, relation for all the layers. So you write H1 star H1, H2 star H2, and then you get V. So you see the difference here, in here, I fixed one layer and write all the relations. So all everything happening in le uh, level one or everything happening is level two. But when I'm doing the, the other relations, I fix the edge and I go through the whole layer. So H1 and H2 and I get that. Okay, so this is the definition of a weighted Levy path algebra. And if you write it formally, it's just a little bit of tweak from the Levy algebra definition and you get that. And the, the punchline is that with this, you can get the example of Levitt, namely Levitt had this L n n plus k. Remember that? So I can just get now here n plus k loops. And each of, so n plus k loops. And each of these loops has weight n. So if you plug this graph, into this definition of a weight levy path algebra, you get this one here. Okay. And remember, this one has no zero divisors. Okay. So now I need two more definitions, and then I, I can give you the, yeah, the, the representation of these algebras. So, definition. Okay. So, E is a weighted graph. And if you don't like, this, just think of the usual graph. And then what I get is just a representation of Levy path algebra. So, and I want to define something called the covering of a graph. And yeah, so what is the covering of a graph? So T is a covering, T is a weighted graph, is a covering for E. If locally, T and E behave similarly. Namely, you have a morphism from T to E. And by morphism on the level of graph, that means, look, if you have a vertex V, it goes to some vertex here, maybe V prime. If you have a vertex W, it goes to V W prime. And then if you have an edge here, when, I, when you push this edge, it has to end up here, right? So everything has to fit. Okay, so you have a morphism here such that now, if I say weighted, then also if this has weight 10, then when you push it here, it has weight 10. So the morphism also respects the weight. But if you don't like it, if you don't like weighted graph, just think of just usual graphs. And then the next thing is that, yes, I want this to be locally the same thing. Namely, if V, I push it and I get to V prime and in V prime, there are three edges getting out. In V also three edges should go out. If in V prime two edges get in, here also two edges get in. So locally should behave the same way. So now let me give you an example of a covering of a graph. And I think this is what you had in mind, um, really example. So if I give you this graph, which has just one vertex and two loops, this could be one covering graph. So, it's an infinite uh, path. Each of them has two edges and everything collapses. So the map, everything collapses to you. All, all these collapses to you. And as you see in each point, this collapses here, two edges getting out, two edges getting out, two edges getting in, two edges getting in. So in each point, yeah, it behaves similar. Okay. So this is a covering. Now, what is a representation? And this is something that uh, I always ask, have you seen this before? Because we haven't seen it anywhere else, definition. 
representation of a graph. Okay, so E weighted graph. And then I remember this one that if the graph has an edge with weight three, this E hat has all the three edges there. So this is just a, just a usual directed graph. Okay, so now I say that F is a representation of E. If you have a morphism from, so F is a usual, I know that this is, this is a weighted graph, but this is a usual graph. And you have a map from F to E hat. So these are all usual graphs. Okay, such that, Locally, phi covers all outgoing tags and all uh, incoming structured edges. So in a second, I'll, I'll, I'll mention what, what I mean here. So first of all, if this is your weighted graph, and then the weight of E is three, the weight of F is two, and the weight of H is two and so on. Maybe the weight of K is two. So this is your E. Then E hat is just the same thing, but now I consider all these. So E hat is, E1, E2, E3, F1, F2, K1, K2, and H1, H2. Okay, good. Now I had these two things that I have to tell you what, what I mean here. So the tag of EI is, this is a definition I. So I want to make sure I know in what layer I'm working. So tag of EI, that means I'm on the ith layer. So I, the tag gives me the layer of that. And the, the structure of EI gives me the actual edge E. Okay, now let's go back to the definition. So I want an F, maybe I will do it for an F which covers E hat, so maybe here, this is U, V, which goes to here. And then it says that locally, this F covers, it covers all the tags and it covers all the structured edges. What does it mean? Okay, so now let's look at the tags. So you have three tags here, one, two, three, one, two. So the maximum tags you have is one, two, three. So V, which goes to you, I have to cover all the tags, okay? So what do I mean by that? So what if in V, an edge going out and I want to get E1 and E3, okay? So now E1 goes to E1, goes to E1, good. E3 goes to E3. So I've covered the tag one and two, three. The tag two, I haven't yet, covered. So maybe I just get here F2. Now I have covered all the tags, right? E1, E1, one, two, three. I've covered all the tags. Okay. Now the other way around, I need to cover all the structured edges in incoming structured edges. That means I don't care about the tags. I just want to get this H and K right. So here, I get H, maybe one, doesn't matter H one or two. I just want to get the, the structure there. And I get also maybe K two. Okay, so my representation graph at this point looks like this. But as you see, I can choose different things. I could choose E1, E2 and E3, right? So this covers all the tags, one, two, three, and then the other way around, the incoming, I could do, of, of course, I have to have H and K, but I could do H2 and K2. So as you see, I have a lot of different options here. This one comes here, or maybe this one comes here. Okay. 
Now, the game starts here. Um, you have different options that all locally all comes to the same thing. But when you put them together, they have to, they have to fit uh, like jigsaw puzzle, right? They have to fit. It's not that it's up to me which one I choose. So you'll see in a second what I mean. Although I have options, but when I put them together, it, they force each other. So let me give you one example here. What if I want to get the actual representation graph for this F1, F2, F3, G1, uh, E1, E2, E3. So it has um, one vertex, two loops with uh, weight three. Okay. And here I put, this is my representation. So from V1 should be, first of all, V1, two things should come to V1. One should be named F, one should be named E. I don't care about the tax. So let me just take care of that. So maybe E1 comes in, so E came in and F2 comes in. So now E and F comes in, that's good. Now from V1, all the three tax should go out. So this one's E1. Three tax should go out, okay? So E1 is out, F2 is out. I have to have another one goes out to cover three. Okay, so now. Sorry, just, just to tell you that you, I mean, you should be, like near in the end of your talk. Okay, okay. So I'll, already passed. All right, okay. One hour past. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll finish in five minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, good, good. So, um, so as you see, I don't have that many choices here. So there are two things should come in. So E and F comes in. Then there is nothing else should come in. So, but three things should go out. Therefore, it forces that the last one should go somewhere else. So it goes here. Now with this one, F is coming in. So E has to come in. So I put E here and then something else has to go out but nothing should come in again. So it forces me to have somewhere here, E3. Okay, so now let me just show you the actual picture. Here it is. Okay, so now the covering graph of this is this one. And I was trying to actually imitate that. So you see, you have a lot of options, but in each point they have to fit together. So it's not up to you which one you choose. All right, so this is your F. Now out, now out of this F, I get a K vector space generated by all the vertices. Okay, so generated by all these vertices, get a vector space. Now the next step is that I want to tell you how the Levy path algebra acts on this. So how the L E W acts on this VF. And here it is. So I have to tell you, imagine you have one of these vertices and you want to act with E, okay? So in Levit path algebra, so remember, this is your graph. So your, it involves E1, E2, E3, F1, F2, F3, okay? So how can I say E1 times V1 times E1? What do I get, right? Because E1 is an element of the Levy path algebra. Okay, you, you come here, this is V1 and look, E1 is here and it pushes V1 to itself. So I get here V1. Let me give you one more interesting example. What if I say V1 times E2? Just look at this one here, V1, and this is E2. So slide V2 along this and you get V3. So everything now moves along the graph. So, and the last example, what if I want to say you have V4 times E2 star and then E3. See what happens here. So you have V4, E3 star, you go backward and then uh, maybe V5, V5 here. So V5, E2 star goes here and then with the other one, it pushes here. So you go backward and then you come forward. So you travel along this edge, uh, along these edges, right? So therefore, Thus, VF is a 
module. All right, so now, sorry, I, it took a long time. So the story goes, I, I'm finishing in one minute. The story goes as follows. First of all, we can give you a criterion when VF is simple and also when VF is indecomposable. And I think that gives you maybe for the first time simple modules for these kind of Levy path algebras that you cannot, uh, Levy algebras that you cannot reach via Levy path algebras. Um, and finally, maybe I just put here one more example that you, 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 you see you have a lot of choices for. So this is, um, these are here. The graph is E1, E2, F1, F2. And you have this representation, these representations, these are all different representations for the same graph here. And as you see, this one is a, similar to the Cayley graph. Yeah, the uh, group. Yeah, free group. Yeah, that's right. And then the final thing is that we have a criteria for the simplicity and which of these gives you sim simple, mo simple module, the one we have to, uh, the one which is not self-similar among these. Look here, if you look at this, I'm repeating the same thing in every place. You see every place is the same thing. So you, are, you have self-similarity here. So that doesn't give you a simple module. This also, as you see, I have self-similarity everywhere. So that also doesn't give me a simple module also here. The only one that it's not self-similar is this one. So this one gives you a simple module for this algebra. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, <clears throat> let me wait a second. So here. Uh, okay. Uh, so, are there any questions? So, uh, is all of them? I'll yeah. ask one quick question. Sure. So, so do do we have any sense of? Uh, so we have a way of constructing now some simple modules over let's say l two three right and do, do we have some sense of how many of them we've captured or do we have some examples of simple modules that aren't captured in this algorithmic way or um i'm i'm sure that um there yeah you don't you don't capture all of them that i'm sure because even on the on the weight one mm when you do weight one, the simple modules that you get on weight one is just the chain simple modules. So we are not gonna construct new ones. So therefore I'm sure that also on the higher level, you get some simple modules, but these are not all of them. And, and we have some examples of how to write down things that don't come from this al algorithm? Uh, simple. I, no, I mean, no, so I we don't know any other simple modules which are not constructed by this. I don't think we we have we have. Okay. You know. Thank you. Uh, so there might be other ways to construct new ones, yeah, which is not this way, yeah. If if you allow me, I want to show you what I meant by the undecidability. Hmm. So it's this theorem four four three. This is Benson's book, Representations and Cohomology. Um, so the finite dimensional algebras over a finite uh, over a algebraically closed field are all quotients of path algebras of weavers. And the, they are classified into finite representation type, which means that the 
finitely generated modules uh, that are in the composable are finitely many. Time, that means that they come in families that are parametrized. So for example, the modules over the polynomial ring in one variable that are uh, of finite dimension over K uh, are tame because that's what the Jolman forms tells you. They are parameters by one parameter. And um, okay, and then there's if they are not tame or uh, finite representation time, they are white. So you cannot hope to classify all uh, the composable modules, right? And part of this is, a, and among this wild thing is this theorem. And the, the explanation of what decidability means is written right there. So I don't know. Uh, I also was, I'm curious about if there is, is so you see there is a, some relation with the field ring in two variables and L2. So that's why I brought it. Uh, and also, uh, I found it curious that the Cayley graph, which is the Cayley graph of the group, free group in two variables, mm -hmm. again, appears as a representation of L2. So is there any philosophical reason for that? Let me stop this. Um, So we have one one result which says that um, so if you if you have this L two you have a universal covering of L two so imagine graph with two loops okay so you have a construction of a universal cover it's very standard yeah. and that it looks like this uh, Cayley graph F two of this one but this is a covering of two loops. Then we have that if you have a covering and you have a representation for the covering, then you already have a the same thing is a representation for the actual graph. So this is the connection that you can get. So you have a graph with two loops. You have the universal covering, which looks like the Kelly graph of free group of order two. And then out of that, you can easily get a representation for this Kelly graph. And by that theorem, that representation is already for loops. But it isn't the, 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 the universal, uh, I, 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 I misunderstand, I, I am using some different notion of covering, I suppose. But I thought that the universal cover of, of L2 was this graph that you wrote where, I mean, there's an infinite uh, string of vertices and two arrows pointing that way always. That, no, the, the classical definition, this is not the universal one. The universal uh -huh. one of two loops is uh, the Cayley graph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the universal for LN is the Cayley graph of the free group on N variables? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's very difficult to draw that. Time, yeah, of course. Oops. Okay, so are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, I see a raised hand there. So please go ahead, ask your question. Um, hello, Dr. Rosbe. <laughs> nice to see you. Hi, um, Hello. So in the setting of, um, in Levitt Path Algebra, um, representations, um, topological Markov chains are already utilized. So my question is, is there a similar connection to of topological Markov chains in the weighted graph setting? Oh, uh, good question, good question. That's something one can look at. I, I, don't, I don't know that yet. That's a good question. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe we can look at it in the future. Thank you. Sure, thank you.
Are there any further questions before I stop the recording? If not, let us thank uh, Ruth and stop the recording. <laughs>